Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today I'm gonna to talk about Sonera Tobani's White Innocence, Western Supremacy, the role of Western feminism in the war on terror. Now, before jumping into it, if you wanna follow me anywhere than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, comment, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I haven't done a video like this in a while, so if you happen to be listening to this podcast form, you can find the video on YouTube. If you found me on YouTube, you'll be able to find the audio for this in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better. If you wanna help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it. If you wanna help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, don't wanna waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's jump into this super important essay discussing the role of Western feminism in the war on terror. So Sonera Tobani is a super interesting scholar to me. I covered one of her other books. This isn't a book, this is just an article, but I covered one of her books titled Exalted Subjects on here, which is a super interesting text. And I highly recommend you go read it or at least listen to what I did on it if that interests you at all, but it's not necessary to understand what's going on here. So the focus of this text for Tobani is to look at the ways that Western feminism functions to maintain Western supremacy in the war on terror following 9-11. So for those that don't necessarily know, the war on terror was a kind of ideological mapping to oppose so-called terrorism following the attacks of September 11th. It was an effort to rid the world of terrorism. Now Tobani points out that there were some other ideological interests that underpin this. She doesn't discuss this one specifically, but for example, oil <laughs> played a pretty big part in the war on terror, where certain parts of the world were being particularly targeted, seem not for, their, uh, for the presence of terrorist organizations, but because oil was readily accessible from those locations. What Tobani is interested in here is not that, Rather, she's interested in the way the war in, on terror functions to maintain a certain status quo or a certain privileging of a Western subject, specifically a Western male subject or a Western white female subject, where the war on terror was used not only to seal uh, certain oil futures, to maintain Western hegemony on the, the world stage, but to also call attention to certain gender dynamics between Muslim men and Muslim women specifically as being ones or being a dynamic that is repressive, that is oppressive, and that tries to limit women's freedoms. So people who were for the war on terror kind of co-opted feminist logics or feminist ideas to further the idea that these people should be treated with, they should be dealt with, they should be brought into the 21st century, which is obviously extremely problematic and extremely misguided. So we saw conservatives adopting feminist rhetoric to encourage and to push their geopolitical agenda to further their encroachment, both ideologically and physically, geographically, upon Muslim countries, upon countries that are inhabited primarily by brown people. So it became an issue and this comes from the work of Gayatri Spivak, of liberating, it became white people's obligation to liberate brown women from brown men, which was only a way to cement Western dominance. Now, as far as the essay here is constructed, she spends the first little bit discussing this dynamic, this kind of hidden intent, but then she moves to discuss three pretty prominent feminist thinkers. And those are Phyllis Chesler, Judith Butler, and Zilla Eisenstein. And she says that each of them have very differing views on the war on terror, but each one of them kind of takes for granted or holds as axiomatic the idea of the Western white subject as being the universal subject that can be extended anywhere and that should be kind of sought after, should be emulated by everybody. And she goes through them methodically to demonstrate just how their work maintains Western hegemony on the world stage. Now, for those that aren't familiar, Phyllis Chesler is 
a pretty prominent feminist figure who falls quite comfortably if we submit to these these broad categories she falls quite comfortably in the domain of second wave feminism which is code word for white feminism it is a feminism that is interested in liberating white women from living or working you know being exclusively mothers or being exclusively uh, housekeepers when third wave feminism came along again if we're just kind of adopting this language or adopting these broad categories third wave feminists began to ask okay upon whose labor then is it contingent that these women can be liberated from the house and that labor would often then fall on BIPOC women BIPOC people of color who would have to take up those roles that white women were suddenly liberated from so the third wave feminists said, well, we have to really be careful here to make sure that these kinds of structures aren't being replicated and being intensified against BIPOC women. So Chesler falls pretty comfortably in that camp, and she was very clear in her views on the war on terror that she was in support of it. She thought that Islam was not a nice religion. She thought that in the Islamic world, women were being oppressed by Islamic men. And she used that to further her own faith, her own um, interest in the war on terror. So Tobani intervenes by saying, obviously this is problematic because it is imposing upon these women a certain idea, imposing upon brown women a certain idea of how to properly be in the world. And I remember watching this one TikTok and I can't give credit to the person you know, I don't even know if they came up with this idea, but I think that it's a particularly powerful one where this TikToker was saying it's quite oppressive to tell people of any culture that what they're wearing is a sign of oppression. So they use as an example the fact that if any one of us in, let's say, Canada, where I am, were to go to like a public pool, women are expected to wear bikini tops or else they're going to get in trouble when that is totally ridiculous. It's totally arbitrary that men's nipples are allowed to be seen, but women's nipples are not. Now, if someone were to come along or another country were to come in and say, that is oppressive, all women, you should not be allowed to wear bikini tops now because it is a sign of oppression, because it undoubtedly is, it is a sign of oppression, that in itself would be another form of oppression being worked on women's bodies because it's telling them what they can and cannot do what they can and cannot wear. And the same applies in people like Phyllis Chesler's arguments against Islam as being oppressive because women are expected to wear certain things that they take to be a sign of oppression when imposing or restricting that access to those things is in itself another form of oppression that works to maintain that status quo of oppression by the West upon Eastern others upon others that do not abide by these um, Western ideals. So Tobani also points out that in Chesler's work, she says that, or Chesler says, oh, it is so wonderful to be able to live in America as a woman because you can enjoy relative affluence, uh, you know, freedom from immediate harm if we accept her, her ideas. But then Tobani comes along and says, well, you know that most of that privilege is predicated upon the continued exploitation of others, both at home and abroad, where any kind of wealth that is being accrued in the Western world is mostly dependent upon labor happening in other parts of the world, or even at home, on people being continually exploited, not to mention having mostly brown, Hispanic women working in people's houses in order to keep them proper for these affluent people. So to say that things are relatively better demands we ask, why is that the case? Who is paying the bill at the end of the day for things to be relatively better? Now from considering Phyllis Chesler, Tobani takes aim at Judith Butler. So Judith Butler is a name that many of us probably know in that she's a pretty big proponent of or big figurehead in this domain of third wave feminism, specifically post-structuralist feminism, where she asks questions about what it, what gender means. Does gender exist in the world naturally? What is the relationship between sex and gender? Is it that 
gender is a mirror of sex or is sex created in response to the creation of gender? And these are some questions that she raises. And so she would have, at least at first glance, a pretty good outlook of this dynamic of the war on terror as being obviously a negative one, and she's very critical of it. But Tobani points out that in Butler's work, she makes some very interesting claims, or she holds to be axiomatic or as an assumption, some basic premises that demand interrogation. So in Butler's work, she considers what it means for a life to be grievable, where she says that some people on earth don't live grievable lives because they can just die with without any repercussions happening. They are almost less than human. And this is something that mostly befalls brown and black bodies. Now, Butler wants to overturn this, wants to think about how we frame bodies as being grievable because of the wound that was inflicted on 9-11, where she says, look, we know now what it's like, or we know now what it's like to experience or to go through a kind of grief that it was produced through 9-11. And so therefore, we can better understand the experiences of others. And so Tobani is quite suspicious of this and says, like, is there really a similarity to be drawn between violence inflicted against the United States as a reaction to their continued imperialism of the Eastern world, of the, the Middle East, and the suffering experienced in the Middle East at the hands of America's continued imperial efforts. So Tobani is like, this is a false parallel. You can't really be saying that we learn through this experience how to then understand the experiences of others because it's entirely context specific and it just seeks to take as the Western subject something that can be universalized to say that anything that happens to this Western subject can then be used to understand everyone else's suffering when it would seem as though the suffering of others took place first yet there was no discourse there around um, extracting that of expanding that suffering onto the rest of the world because it was seen as being derivative to the Western universal subject. Now, additionally, Butler says that in order to maybe curb this idea that some bodies are not uh, grievable while others are, is to put them more on display, to, to televise more suffering almost, to make these bodies, these lives more grievable. And Tobani says, well, who is that for? It's certainly not for brown people in the case of the Middle East who are continually undergoing the suffering to Muslim men and women who are constantly undergoing the suffering. It's, it's not for them. So it just seeks, the suggestion just seeks to then cement the Western subject as being the one that needs to see the world for any suffering to be legitimized. It is only when it is acknowledged by this subject that it can then be taken seriously. And then finally, she considers the work of Zilla Eisenstein, who is very much on Tobani's wavelength to some extent, but makes a critical error for Tobani that, that she really uh, digs into because she's very correct about her criticism. Where in Eisenstein's work, she says the entire issue around the war on terror is the subjugation of women, both in the West and in the Middle East, where Tobani says, no, no, no. We cannot forget that there, there's no magical alliance between all women. And this is a pretty common uh, white liberal feminist idea that all women are undergo some kind of similar discrimination. When we know quite well from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and, and among others, that brown women are going to be affected in ways that are diametrically opposed and different and even antagonistic to the ways that white women experience suffering, where white women are culprits in all of this as well. So in Eisenstein's work, she's trying to draw these alliances between white women and brown women as being on the same side against a patriarchal structure, where Tobani says that's not quite true because white women are often the perpetrators of these very structures and enjoy all the benefits of being a part of that Western system that continually motivates itself, that continually propels itself by maintaining Western hegemony over the world. And that is essentially her text here. It's a very good one, short uh, and sweet and very direct. And it's something I definitely recommend anybody read. If I got anything wrong, something I should have mentioned, I'd love to hear about it. If 
you know, you like what I did and you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else where you can leave a review or a comment, you know, I'd love for you to drop five stars, leave a review. I read them all. I don't have the time to respond to all of them, but I love hearing from you. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.